Professor Furstenberg, we first want to congratulate you for being awarded the Abel Prize in Mathematics for 2020, a prize you share with Gregory Margulis. You received the prize because, and here we cite the Abel Committee, for pioneering the use of methods from probability and dynamics in group theory, number theory and combinatorics. Can you tell us when you first got enamored with mathematics and when you discovered that you had an exceptional mathematical talent? Well, I, uh, perhaps I should say that I had, a, I've, I had a head start in mathematics. If you include adding and multiplying as mathematics, uh, because of the fact that when, uh, when we came to the United States, we were, I was born in Germany and, and at roughly the age of five or so I came to the United States and lived with a, an uncle who had a poultry farm and went to a, a rural school which I think had only four classrooms. And so I was in, the, I was in a class, I was, when I was in kindergarten, I was in a class with first grade and second grade. So it was easy for me to get a little bit ahead of where, of where I should have been or where I might have been. That was one, that's one aspect. And another aspect was that I, 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 I had a sister who was three years older than I was, and she always kept me ahead. When I was, we were learning, the class was learning addition, I learned multiplication, we were learning fractions, and I learned algebra. And so I was always a little bit ahead. And of course, you, uh, you feel good about things that you're that you're a little bit better than a lot of the people or most of the people in the class. And uh, um, when I was in high school, I really enjoyed uh, Euclidean geometry that we learned, that was taught in high school. And, uh, um, and I also, I, uh, well, I guess I enjoyed the challenge and uh, you know, doing things you're able to do things your way, and, and it, it doesn't. You don't have to follow definite rules. Just your your own thinking. If it's clear, logical, you'll you'll get to the right answer. And so I enjoyed that. And um, and I also, I guess, when we were learning algebra. I learned. We learned. I learned about imaginary numbers when I was in high school. And uh, I thought it would be. An, I, I could make my name in mathematics if I proved that if I showed that using imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one is going to lead to some contradiction in mathematics. So I filled pages and pages of, of calculations and of course didn't get anywhere, but it's, uh, that was, it was good experience just doing the calculations and maybe good experience to be a little frustrated in, in, in what you want to, you want to show something and it doesn't work out, but still you, you don't feel bad about it. And, uh, I think that that was pretty clear that I, I was enjoying mathematics. And uh, one thing I, I should mention, uh, a, friend of, a friend of mine who's an mathemati uh, important mathematician at Harvard, Shlomo Sternberg, he and I were in the same class in high school. And somehow both of us, well, we both have heard of an, an interesting, challenging problem in geometry, just ordinary geometry, given given a, a triangle and two of the angle bisectors have the same length, prove that the triangle is isosceles, which is obviously trivial to do the other way around. And, um, and that's a rather difficult problem, which I would have trouble doing today. At any rate, we both came out with our own, each with our own solution to this uh, after some time. And so it happens that the, the, the high school I went to was in the same building as Yeshiva College because we had the college in the same building as the high school. And um, at that time, there was a journal called Scripta Mathematica, for part of recreational, historical aspects of mathematics, but, but it, was very, it was a good journal at that time. It's, since then, it no longer exists. At any rate, the editor of that journal, Yekutiel Ginsberg, was, had an office in, in our building, in the building uh, where we were, we were in high school. So the, uh, so the two of us went up to, got up our courage, went up to Professor Ginsburg, showed us, showed him our, <laughs> we've solved this problem, and he began, he took it upon himself to encourage us, and, uh, 
and particularly he encouraged me further and gave me opportunities to get ahead and uh, also earn money. My, our financial situation at home was not that good because my mother was widowed while we were on the way to the United States. And uh, um, so it was clear that I, would, I should be earning money to help out. And uh, what Professor Ginsburg did was he gave me a job at, with, the, with the journal. I would, I would uh, do some of the graphics, I would translate articles from French to English, whatever, and, uh, um, and in many ways he encouraged me and I owe a lot to him. At any rate, uh, with this background, I think it was pretty clear that mathematics is, is the direction that I want to go into. While you were an undergraduate student at Yeshiva University, you published three papers. Two of these appeared in the journal American Math Monthly. We will focus on one of these papers titled On the Infinitude of Primes. This paper of length half a page, but that belies the originality and perhaps the motivation it gave to your later works. Uh, on the interplay between topology, dynamical systems, and number theory. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah, okay, well, I, let me just say that the, uh, um, only recently I was asked what made me think of putting a topology on the integers, and I didn't have the answer right away, and afterwards I realized that I had been learning, at that time, I'd been learning about piatic, piatic integers with, their, with a piatic topology, and so you could put a non-trivial topology on the integers where integers very far away normally are very close. N factorial is very close to zero and so on. So I had this topology on the integers and, um, um, and looking at it carefully, uh, you, you, sh you prove this theorem, you prove the fact that there must be infinitely many primes, otherwise it turns out that you have a, a set which is, which is open, but it shouldn't be open. At any rate, uh, um, this is a way of looking at the integers, and um, so, the, so I think of the integers somewhat like the unit interval, in the sense that there are you know, you, know the, you know the length, well, there's a topology, you know what the open sets are, and the open sets, or at least the basic open sets, here they are intervals, and here they are arithmetic progressions, and they have a very natural measure, you know, the length of the interval, the density of an arithmetic progression. So maybe we could put measure theory on the, on the integers, just like we have on the, on the interval. And so this idea of looking at something happening on the integers as something happening on a measure space came out in some natural way from just this early paper on the infinitude of primes. And uh, that's one aspect of it. The, uh, um, Your PhD th thesis from 1958, titled Prediction Theory, was later published in 1960 with the title Stationary Processes and prediction theory, and it was published in Princeton Annals of Mathematical Studies. Your thesis advisor at Princeton University was Solomon Bochner. What really fascinated us about this paper was that you prove as a byproduct a very famous uh, approximation result by Hermann Weil by using dynamical systems. This is the first time that ever was done, isn't that correct? As far as I know, I mean, you know, use, looking at things dynamically is, is uh, I, I have to say I don't know of a precedent for that. Looking at number, number of theoretic issues dynamically, that, um, I think that was a, uh, a first. <laughs> the, um, and it came about in a rather, rather indirect way, the, uh, um, in studying, in studying prediction. I mean, the, uh, um, I mean, first of all, the, the idea of looking at, at say, the integers as a, uh, as a measure space, um, the next step is to look at a, um, I mean, dynamic or ergodic theory looks at a measure space with a transformation that preserves the measure. Now, the integers with a measure of density, like the density of the arithmetic progressions, and, and so on, that's also that, that measure is preserved under translation. So the, uh, so the idea of, of uh, 
thinking of something happening on the integers as like a dynamic, something of a dynamic nature is, is not unnatural. The problem of prediction that I, that I looked at, um, and here uh, the motivation for looking, doing prediction theory is, is, comes from the fact that Norbert Wiener, who was, you might say, one of my heroes, in, and had did, done some very pr profound work with his Tauberian theorems in, in harmonic analysis. And his, the latest thing that he had worked on at that time was, was his prediction theory, which was, which was closely related to harmonic analysis. But in his prediction theory, the, the objects you get are functions that are defined almost everywhere. And so the question that arose that I wanted to answer was, suppose you're given a, exactly a certain past, past meaning something that, somewhat, something that happened yesterday, the day before, the day before, and so on, up to minus infinity, so to speak. So this is this I call the past. And you're given the past, and you want to, well, you would like to be say exactly what's in the future, but you usually cannot say that. If, if for example, what you were looking at was a coin tossing, then what, all you can say is that, well, the next, the next reading would be with probability a half heads with probability a half tails, and so on. So to go into the f entire future, what you want to define is a stochastic process. What are the probabilities for what's happening in the future, given what you, what you have in the past? And um, uh, so there are certain situations in which you can do this, and uh, that's what it's elaborated in my, in my dissertation. Now the first step, and this is how prediction theory connects with stationary processes, is to, to look at the past and to associate to that a, a stationary process, which is, in other words, this is a, you want to look at this as a typical sequence of some stationary process, of, which a stationary process arises by evaluating a function on a, on a probability, uh, probability space on which there's a measure-preserving transformation, so the, uh, which represents change in time. So the statistics of the process today and tomorrow is the same as the statistics will be a week from now and a day after and so on. The, uh, so the point is, the, the, uh, um, I found a method of, uh, of going from the individual sequence to the process, which is inverting the ergodic theorem. In the ergodic theorem, you're applied to stationary processes, you can say what in terms of expectations, you can say what's, what's happening at almost every sample sequence. And the idea is to go from what, you, what I would like to be a sample sequence to the process of which it could be looked at as a, typi as a typical sequence. Now actually, you know, to reverse the point of view in the, in the sense that I'm given a particular sequence and I want to build from that particular sequence a process, and the, uh, a stationary process. And the idea is you, look, you assume that, that densities are defined in this, in this past. In other words, you can say that, um, let's say it is a plus one minus one uh, sequence. So you notice that the plus ones occur two thirds of the time, minus one occurs one third of the time, and they occur together at one seventh of the time and so on. And in other words, you know this, you can infer the statistics from the given sequence. And from this statistics, you build the stationary process. Now, um, there's more, more, there's a more direct way of, uh, another way, you might say more constructive of building the space on which the stationary process is, is defined by just taking the sequence itself and looking at all its translates and now close that, sp that space of, trans of sequences in the, in the usual topolo product topology, um, the Tychonoff topology, and, the, uh, um, and that gives you a compact space. And then you'll, on that space, you define a measure given what's happening on the sequence um, and I mention this way because, in fact, this, this has a precedent in, professor, in Bachner's approach to almost periodic sequences or, the, or almost periodic functions. 
what he, what he did was to say almost periodic functions have a certain property that if you look at their translates and you look at the closure of these translates, then you have a compact space <clears throat> in, the, in the strong topology. The fact that it's compact in the weak topology is, is immediate, but that it's also compact in the strong topology, that turns out to characterize almost periodic functions. So this idea of embedding a single sample sequence in a, in a whole family of sequences is due to Bachner, although I, I didn't know it at the time, but in, 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 that is a precedence for, for the things that I, I was doing. The, uh, um, now, how you get to, the, there is a, the particular um, Diophantine problem, which came out, which appears in my dissertation, and which encouraged me to try to look for dynamical systems for other, for other uh, number theoretic problems, was that in studying, in studying this prediction, there's a certain kind of relationship between what's going on in, in the sequence of the past, and when you look at the entire, entire past, plus the, the stochastic process, which represents the future. Um, and it's a, first, we're looking at a product space, all the sequences of the past and all the possible stochastic processes. And you're looking at a certain subset of these. And they have a dynamic in the sense that they have certain dynamics, which um, um, point is the, the idea, which is a little bit subtle, that if I look at, if I, if I complete the past and go look at, I, I add to what happened in the past what's happening today, then... I know I can, and if I knew what the, what the stochastic process of the entire future was given yesterday's information, and given today means I'm conditioning things on certain information. So I can get the, I can get the next step in the, in the prediction from the new step in the, in the process, in the, in the bottom process, think of the past as the, being the bottom, and, and, uh, and some information, a little bit of information about the, about the stochastic process. Well, this dynamically represents, this is an example of a skew product. I have a system in, in, in for example, irrational rotation of the circle. And I have a, a circle, I think, of, I think of a torus, a circle above this, this basis. And the circles move I mean, I go from one circle to the next circle in accordance to some rotation, which depends on where I am. It's not, it's not, a, constant, not a constant rotation, but it depends on where I am. Well, it turns out that if you look at the orbit, in, in this particular case, so, the so-called Anzai Kakutani process, which they use for different reasons, um, if you look at the orbit of the point zero, zero, under this process, you can show using ideas from ergodic theory, you can show that it's equidistributed in the torus, that this orbit is equidistributed, which means that any one of the, one of the coordinates will also be equidistributed in, in the circle. And under this particular dynamical system, the, that orbit, that, that coordinate happens to be n squared is, is a, and 4a, 9a, 16a, where a is some irrational, well, is the, is the amount of the rotation of the, of the base space, which is interesting. That is, in the, in the, I assume if a is irrational, you can prove, for example, you can prove the density by, in various ways, density of the, uh, of the orbit, and that gives you the density of n squared alpha mod 1, which is originally proved by, by Weil with the, his method of trigonometric series. And uh, so this gave a dynamic proof of, of Wilde's theorem. And uh, so that encouraged me in general. Why, why look at the, can I look at a, a sequence as a sample sequence of some dynamical system? And then study the dynamical system and see what you can say. And this is what eventually became the Samaradi theorem, where, where I look at the, I'm given a, a set that has positive density and you want to prove that in that set, you have a, an arithmetic progression, say, of length three. In other words, I can go from one point with in m ste steps to another point of the set, again, m steps to another point of the set, or longer arithmetic progressions. Now, with this point of view that, that the integers are a measure space, and adding one 
to, a, to an integer is a measure-preserving transformation. So what am I looking at? I want to, I have, I, I'm looking at a set, and I want to show that I return to that set under the same number of steps twice. In other words, what is, what is recurrence? And there, if I want to know just that it goes once, that's the Poincaré recurrence theorem. But what I want is what's now called multiple recurrence. I want to know that with the same amount, with the same step, I can get, a, get back again. And it won't be true for every step. It's not true that whenever I get back to the set in so and so many steps, I can get back to it again in that many steps. But there is a step, in fact, infinitely many steps, that that step and done again will return me to the, to the set. And that's the measure theoretic version of Samarady's theorem. And, uh, um, and the idea of this correspondence, once you have this correspondence, you, you prove the measure theoretic thing and then you get the number theoretic thing. So I, I, I want to ask you a question there because uh, the, you're now talking about what has been called the correspondence principle. Yes, exactly. This is the correspondence. I'm using the correspondence principle. And, and, but the point being is that this principle already appears in your thesis. Of course, you use it in the Simaretis, uh, on your proof of the Simaretis uh, theorem, but it already occurs in your thesis. Is that correct? But, but it's not called, it's not set up as a principle, just uh, use it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but, but, so, but you have two important concepts in your thesis that, that seem to be uh, concepts that you come back to several times and been important in, this, uh, in the theory. And one is the correspondence principle, and the other is that of an isometric extension. You briefly mentioned things uh, connected to that. Could you, could you say, what, what is that? Okay, that is quite a, um, Let's see, first, first of all, in, in the thesis, the, this principle appears not explicitly, but it's implicit. Now, the idea is, how do I go from an explicit past to a process that is basically the correspondence principle, by corresponding to something going on in the integers, to something going on on a, on a measure space. And um, so that, that's, that's the first time really that the principle was used as a, in some way that could be called a principle. This particular example of the, this Anzai Kakutani example turned out, turns out to be in terms of dynamical systems, I have a big dynamical system on the torus, on the two torus, and a smaller one on the circle, and the big one is an extension of the smaller one, in the sense that instead of two, looking at the, both coordinates, you're looking at one coordinate, but that one coordinate also moves according to a certain rule. And so the, uh, the x goes into x plus a, and the y goes in some, some other way, but the point, so x, y going to x, is a factoring of the big system to a smaller system. Then, but it's also a factoring in a special way, which is, which is an isometric extension, in the sense that two points on the torus that sit over the same point of the circle, they move, they don't change, they're, they're rotated. So they don't change their distance from one another, and so that's, that's called, that kind of thing is called an isometric extension, because it goes by isometries. Which isometry depends on where you are. Here you move so much, here you move a different way, and, and that can be studied, and the, the properties from the bottom system can be carried over to the top system, or, or at least studied. And uh, um, if I had a blackboard, I would show exactly what, what, are, what kind of sets you would get and so on, but at any rate, the important thing is that you can study isometric extensions and the, uh, for, of a given system. And then actually, and that turns out to be an example of what's called distal, which also plays an important role in, in my work. The um, distal means that to, in, in the simplest system is a system in where you pre simply preserve the distance between two points. Now the system is a transformation on, on a metric space for our purposes. If the, tra the tra transformation is isometric, it presents all the distances. But here, distal is Says, says that if two points are distinct, they don't, you don't preserve the distance, but you never get closer than a certain amount, which depends on where the points are, depends on the two points. So this particular system that I've been describing, where you rotate the bottom coordinate, the upper coordinate rotates according to where you are, I claim this is distal, why? Because if you start with two points that are above two distant 
to diff different points below. They're moving below, it moves isometrically by rotation. So they so you never get close, your two, your two circles on top never get closer than a certain amount, which means those two points, wherever they are, have to stay a certain, at least a minimal distance. So that's good if they're on different circles. What if they're on the same circle? Well, on the same circle, because it's an isometric extension, they say exactly the same distance apart throughout their, their orbits. So this example, which I, I was interested in because of it being a Diophantine application of dynamics, is also a, an interesting example of a, of a distal system, which is not in itself is not isometric, doesn't, does not preserve uh, distance. Now this had been a question, is it, does this, perhaps distality implies isometry, preserving the same, and perhaps in a different metric. Um, and this is the case, in fact, if the space happens to be zero-dimensional. This was proved by uh, Bob Ellis before I, I, before I knew about distality. And anyway, uh, what you can see is that if you have a distal system, not necessarily a circle, you have some distal system below, and above it you have an isometric extension, then the top system will again be distal for the same argument that we used before. So that means if I want to get examples of distal, I can start with a circle, put a circle extension of that, put a circle extension on top of that, and another circle extension on top of that, and actually go infinitely far, and I will get a distal system. Now that's now we we are in your sixty three fam famous paper on um, the on the structure of distal flows. Right, are we? right, exactly. The uh, um, first of all, I say circle, but it could be a sphere that's moving. That's I have a sphere here and a sphere here, and it goes by some rotation, and it could be in a general compact metric space, homogeneous metric space, which is rotated. So that's a general isometric extension. So. Those are the only distal systems I know, so I say maybe they're the only ones. And that was the structure theorem for distal systems. Is there a similar result for, for ergodic system, measure theoretic uh, systems? That's the, that's the crucial point in the proof of the Samoradi theorem. For, first of all, you have this, what I've been describing, which you could call a distal system. So that every ergodic system has as its base a, a distal factor, which might just be a rotation. But then after, when you've, when you've exhausted this, you don't necessarily exhaust the whole system. The ergodic system is not distal, but you have what you call a weak mixing extension. In other words, the next step, there is another step that you go, and, um, um, and that's relatively weak mixing. There's a notion of weak mixing, which means that things get get very mixed up and, uh, uh, and there's such a relative notion and using that distal plus a relative weak mixing that gives you the most general that gives the most general ergodic system what's that good for namely the uh, um, that, that in that way I can prove the Samoradi theorem in its ergodic version using this structure proving it bit by bit, proving that it's true for a distal system, which means proving that it's true for rotations and isometric extensions, and then showing that if it's true for a system, it's true for a weak mixing extension. Now maybe I'll say something about the, <laughs> the origin of this proof was uh, um, yes. the, the, uh, the fact which was, to my mind, sort of accidental. That, that year that this was done, was the first year of the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University. And uh, that the Institute, the idea of the Institute was to invite people to, to focus on, some, on two subjects. One would be in the, in, the, in the sciences and one would be in the humanities. And uh, so, some, so uh, we proposed that this topic in the sciences would be ergodic theory. The math department proposed that and what we were told that we can invite people from all over the world who are in that area and we would have a, a special year in ergodic theory. And, and we had Donald Ornstein, Daniel Rudolph, and, and uh, uh, Jean-Pierre um, uh, um, uh, Touvenot from France and other, other, 
people, other ergodic theorists who came together for that year. And in a, at the, at the, at the, we were all at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, at the Hebrew University in, in, in Jerusalem. And uh, so there were a number of topics that came up and were dealt with. And um, there was uh, Professor Konrad Jacobs was one of the, one of the early authors of, of a book on, on ergodic theory. And, but at that time, he stopped being interested in ergodic theory, became interested in combinatorics. So he was aware of, of Samaradi's work at that time. Uh, and, uh, and he, asked, he suggested that we invite him to, uh, to, the, Hebrew, to the Institute for, for that year. And uh, we hesitated because he's no longer interested in ergodic theory. Now he's interested in combinatorics. But a man like Konrad Jacobs, he wants to come, we'll invite him. And then he suggested that he give a talk on some, some aspect of combinatorics that he, he found exciting. And I was even less interested in that because we were, inter we were in, in doing ergodic theory, not combinatorics. But again, Konrad Jacobs invited him to give this colloquium talk. And at the time that he gave the colloquium, he listening to his colloquium talk, I was aware of this, well, basically the, the uh, correspondence principle. So I, I, inter I interpreted, it was, it was natural for me to reinterpret the, this theorem, Samaradi's theorem, which, which he was very enthusiastic about to interpret that into ergodic theory. And also, I, I had by that time also information about what, what can you say about a weekly, weekly mixing system. Um, it, it turns out that it's not hard. I had proven that for a weekly mixing system, you have recurrences in more or less any way you want. And in particular, you have recurrences along an arithmetic progression. So if the system that, if the ergodic system that I was dealing with happened to be weekly mixing, then we're finished. Well, what's the other possibility, the other extreme is to look at, say, rotations. What about the Samaradi, ergodic Samaradi theorem for rotations? And there again, it's almost immediate because after, after any rotation which brings you close enough to the identity, if you repeat that, you'll still be close to the identity. And repeat that, you'll still be close to the identity. And in a compact group, there are always, you can get arbitrarily close. If you take any point, you can get arbitrarily close to the identity by iterating that multiplying by that. And so for a compact group, the, uh, the theorem is clear. And so um, um, now all you needed was a structure theorem. And that, and that uh, with the help, I have to say, with the help especially of Benjamin Weiss and uh, Izzy Katznelson, who himself was an ergo, was a, uh, uh, both were interested in harmonic analysis, but Izzy Cuts Nelson particularly interested in harmonic analysis, and, and with their help, I was able to prove this structure theorem, which, uh, which gave the ergodic theoretic proof of the Samaradi theorem. And, uh, was this what is called a Poincaré moment, that you all of a sudden saw how it should be done? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think the, uh, because it began with an, a certain realization that the okay. that this er combinatorial theorem is equivalent actually to the to a er certain ergodic theorem, and let's use the the machinery of ergodic theory, and uh, um, and then it was it was hard work. I mean, from there to the uh, to the end, but not there was no mi minute where no moment where where ah this solves the problem. But it, per perhaps it is an example of cross-fertilization between different mathematical perspectives, and you occasionally should go to the department colloquium to, to see what you can do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The, uh, abs absolutely. No, I certainly learned, learned a lesson from that. But, uh, I, but I have, I, sometimes at one point I was at, at my retirement, um, there, was a, there was a conference held in Jerusalem, and, I was asked to speak about something about probability in mathematics. And I was thinking of my, my own career, and I was thinking that I should really call it the improbability of my mathematics, because this is all, many things came together. The fact that I looked at, had I not looked at distal systems, I wouldn't have known how to 
get this, what, what a, a appropriate structure theorem should be. There was another <laughs> uh, accident, you might say, that in fact I wasn't going to be able to come to this colloquium talk of, uh, of Konrad Yakos because my younger son, at that point, he had just been born a few, a few months before, and at that time it was assumed that I would be the babysitter. Fortunately, my, old, my oldest child, my daughter, was, happened to be free at that time, and she, she came and took my place. And had she not, I wouldn't have heard this colloquial talk. And, uh, uh, perhaps as an end of what we now be talking about, um, um, what the, the work by uh, Kra and Ost about nil systems, could we uh, tell us what they, they did in that work? Yeah, well, the, um, um, it turns out that, if, that in order to study three-step three three step arithmetic progression, you really don't need, if you want to do it ergodic, from the ergodic theoretic point of view, you don't read this entire tower. It's enough just to look at the, uh, at the first step of the, um, just looking at the, um, well, I think maybe even you don't need this step. It's enough to look at the circle. It's just harmonic, ordinary harmonic analysis will, is, is sufficient. But to look at four, you already have to look at the, you have to look at this. In other words, the, in order to study the general situation, the general, you don't have to look at the entire structure. You can, I mean, the entire structure means you have the base a rotation, then you have an isometric extension, then you have another isometric extension, and so on. And so there are steps and and you don't the uh, to, to prove uh, to prove the sum to prove the sum property the arithmetic progression property you don't necessarily have to go all the way up you can just go a certain number of steps and then and then just then you introduce the weekly mixing part so this is the um, um, so the um, the distal part we we'd call a characteristic factor because if you have a certain problem a certain kind of behavior, ergodic behavior of some expression um, uh, on the, well, you can have it for the integers and you have the an analog in, in measure theoretically, then in order to study it, it's enough to study some sort of factor, which is called the characteristic factor, and everything that happens there will happen exactly by just, just uh, averaging, will happen on the top thing, which is basically the, we the weekly mixing step. Now you could assume that that's weekly mixing, it's everything that behaves for your purposes. To study four-term recurrences. Up here, it's enough to study four-term recurrences down below, not all the way, but just one step up, and so on. Now, the, so um, we describe the, the, uh, um, this characteristic factor in terms of isometric extensions. How many extensions do you need? But Host and Kra were able to, to make it even more explicit and show that these isometric extensions are not, not arbitrary. They, they, they correspond to nilpotent actions of a nilpotent group on a nil manifold. That, that, uh, I mean, in particular, you could have your, ex, your isometric extension would, could be by a circle. And the rule for the movement from one circle to the next could be given by, by a certain kind of multiplication, which represents the action of a nilpotent group on a nilpotent homogeneous, a homogeneous um, space, which is called, would be called a nil, a nil manifold. And so they found a, f a way of, of characterizing this, this, uh, this characteristic factor by, the, by certain properties of... Uh, which are now called Gower norms, and uh, which Gower went into more explicitly and uh, has been studied extensively since then. So the, you introduce another concept which has been immensely important, and that is that of a boundary. But perhaps before we get there, uh, could you say something about how the concept of random walks have been important to your, your work? Yeah, um, okay. Well, first of all, let me give you an example of uh, <coughs> of the random walk in a group is I'm, I'm given, say, I'm given a, a, a bunch of matrices and I attach a probability to each one of those and I decide to start multiplying uh, one uh, randomly according to that probability uh, distribution. 
And so I get matrix X1 times X2 times X3 and so on. And I'm interested, and it turns out to be rather easy to show that with some restrictions, the matrices grow exponentially. But I want to know what, hap what is happening, what is happening qu qualitatively in that. Well, what I'm looking at is a, is a random walk inside a group of matrices as I multiply x1, then I multiply by x2, multiply by x3, and so on. So I'm taking a random walk inside this, this group, and I, I want to look at some limiting behavior. Because not all, it's not true that with probability one, there's a s specific limiting behavior. Well, what, what behavior is, is, is there that can, be, that can be called upon? Well, when I multiply this x1 times x2 times x3, it turns out that the, that the, rows, the, the rows of that matrix come closer and closer together, and they tend to point to a certain, to a certain direction. So as you go to infinity, this product gives you a certain direction. And um, a different product would give you a different direction, which is, becomes, a random, becomes a random direction in projective space, basically. So, um, but now, it turns out that if you look, this is for two by two matrices, this is really the only kind of boundary behavior that you can talk about. Now you can ask which point, which point in projective space do they converge to, does it converge to? I mean, I call it converging to, I mean, a matrix is converging to a point by introducing the right kind of topology, by saying that you're close to this point if all your rows are pointing to that, to that direction, or are close to that direction. So you can define a topology in which, say, the projective, projective space, of that dimension, is attached to the group. Now, actually, you can look, in, instead of a single vector, you can look at two columns and look at the... Look at the look at the plane that they span. And that plane also converges to a certain limit plane. And so you now have a flag. You have a line and a, and a plane through it. In general, what, what turns out, you can show, is that when you multiply the matrices, they converge in this kind of term, terminology to a flag of that dimension, of the right dimension. In other words, a, a line and sitting in a plane, sitting in a three space, sitting in a four space, and so on. Um, so the, in some sense, this set of flags, the flag space, I can attach to the, to the group of matrices, in other words, flag, the m-dimensional flag space, on flags of, up to dimension m, I can attach to m times m to matrices, or GLM, uh, general linear group, and, and it makes sense to talk about a random walk converging to a point. And, and now the whole, th what's, what's nice about this is that we can identify for more, in general, for a semi-simple group at least, um, uh, this was what was done in the first paper, we can identify this boundary in general. And it also can be characterized uh, by a certain property of proximality. It's a space on which the group acts. It's a compact space on which the group acts. And it turns out that, that the action is what's called strongly proximal. Proximal means the opposite, it's the opposite of distal. If you get back to distal <laughs> indirectly, it means that any two points under some group element will get as close together as you like. And that means, if you think of it, that any k points with the right group element, they somehow come together. Now, if you think of it in, in terms of two by two matrices and think of the action on the projective line, you can always get two different directions will come together if you use the right matrix. If you multiply by the right linear combination, you'll get the two, two basis vectors to any two other basis, basis vectors. So you have this property of proximality. Now, what, in fact, if you look at that action on the projective line, it's stronger than that. It's, it's what's called strongly proximal in the sense that if you have any measure on the projective space, so think of it as a circle, and by applying a linear transformation, you can get that whole measure as close as you like to a point measure, to a Dirac measure, and that's strong proximality. It's not obvious that the two notions are different, but they are different, and, uh, and it turns out that this boundary is the universal, um, strongly proximal action of the space.
So that's the Furstenberg boundary. That's what's called the Furstenberg boundary, right? And which has applications to C-star algebra, which I don't fully understand. But I, I would like to, 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 to quote uh, from uh, Margulis, I mean, the other Abel Prize uh, winner this year. He writes someplace the following, I learned about Furstenberg's work around 1974 and his boundary theory, theory influenced me very much. In particular, my proof of the so-called normal subgroup theorem could not exist without that theory. And also what Margulis says that this so-called normal uh, uh, subgroup uh, theorem is his favorite theorem. I mean, the one that he re uh, proof he thinks is the best. So he really credits you for uh, giving a crucial idea to that yeah, I'm, I'm very happy about that. And, uh, um, but but, but I, I might say that I, d I might give, give someone else credit here. Um, the, um, when I was, I was at Minnesota, I visited there a number of times, and one of the people who vis in probability theory who visited there was, was Monroe Donsker. Now, Mon Monroe Donsker had a friend, right now I can't think of his name, who was, who was editing a book, a compilation of applications of probability to different, different uh, ideas, to uh, harmonic analysis, so various uh, uh, topics. And he came to me and he said, you know, you should give, for, for this book, or the, the editor was N-E-Y, -E nay, and you should, you should, you should give a, an application of probability theory to algebra. So I thought of the, um, I thought of the, uh, the theory, this theory, this boundary theory, and I thought of the fact that it seems, um, that it seems intuitive that a lattice inside a group some, a, sub, a subgroup of the group which is very close, which is discrete but very close uh, qualitatively to the, to, the, uh, to the group itself, to the whole group, that this should have the same boundary. So using this idea, I, 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 tr I showed how you could use this idea to, to prove another theorem, of, a very special case of a, of a theorem of Margulis, uh, a special case of his general rigidity theorem. And so that's, that way I interacted with, with Margulis also. But the idea that you could use the boundary to do something about the, about the group itself turns out to be, uh, to, uh, the boundary is useful for that. This, this is sort of a jump, but once we're talking about inspiration from other sources, you mentioned to us at a certain time that uh, Gelfand's work on C-star algebras and their representations as function spaces was perhaps the most, the most important inspiration for you at a certain time. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, well, <coughs> Gelfand's, uh, well, well, there are two ways in which Gelfand's theory comes in, and um, <coughs> that's um, mainly this, the correspondence principle uh, can be one way of proving it is using Gelfand's uh, isometry between an arbitrary commutative C-star algebra and an algebra, of, and a, and a, and a algebra of continuous functions on a certain space. In other words, starting with an, al with an abstract algebra, you get a, somehow you get to a, a, a compact space. And this, um, th this is one way of getting, of, of getting the correspondence principle. In fact, uh, uh, sort of a, um, an anecdote, I, I once gave a lecture on, on these things at, at Gelfand's seminar at Rutgers, and Gelfand likes, you, you put down a theorem, and, and Gelfand likes to understand that theorem by himself. He doesn't want to listen to the lecturer uh, explaining the theorem, and, uh, um, and, so, and so he asks, I put the theorem, I put the correspondence principle on the blackboard, you know, given something on the integers, then there's, then there's a measure space, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and he asks, he turns to the class to this, in the seminar and he says, why is this true? And he doesn't, he doesn't know either, but he wants somebody to explain it. And everybody, he gives up. And then I said, it's Gelfand's uh, C-star representa representation theorem. That's how, that's how you get this. That's one way of proving the... Uh, of this correspondence, and, uh, but also the, but um, 
in general, I mean, Gelfand was one of my heroes, and uh, he, one of the things that he did, which, uh, uh, um, which I learned, was one of the things that I learned as a student at Princeton, um, one of the things that he did was to al algebraicize the Wiener-Tauberian theorem, to show how the Wiener-Tauberian theorem really involves algebra, and then at a certain point you need, you need analysis, but, but how algebra is, is the basis of it. And, and um, so this, uh, this was also, in some sense, I think, the inspiration for Loomis's book called Abstract Harmonic Analysis, and how you can generalize harmonic analysis to other, other groups and, and so on. And, um, and the theory of almost periodic functions, which was also one of my inspirations to, in, uh, in getting into, um, as I mentioned, that Bachner had shown that from an al almost periodic function, there is a certain space which turns out to be a group and so on. This, is also, this also comes about by, this, by the correspondence principle. And so um, this idea of, uh, of, of using the Gelfand's theory is, uh, um, is, is at the basis, you might say, the correspondence principle. It's also the basis of my original, uh, original uh, way of getting the boundary of a group. By the connection between boundaries and harmonic functions. And you somehow build, a, build an algebra from harmonic functions. You say how you define a certain way of multiplying harmonic functions, and you get an algebra, and the, and the Gelfand space for that algebra is the, is the boundary of the group. The, uh, of course, what's important here is the connection between random walks and, and harmonic functions, and that you can you can define harmonic functions by, by looking at probabilistic questions on random walks, and vice versa. You can go from the harmonic functions to the random walks. And uh, um, so this was, uh, uh, this is how that came in. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you comment on your paper, the disjointness paper, which turns out to have, to have importance also for applications, not only in mathematics, yeah, you, if you think of the correspondence principle, you um, um, you're given a, you, I think of it in terms of some some s s a sequence which might be a signal, or it might be a sequence that represents noise, and I would like to know what, when can you filter? When can you filter perfectly? Just like I asked, when can you predict perfectly? Or that is, uh, well, in other words, in this pre in prediction, you can also talk about knowing exactly what's going to happen, you can ask, when can I filter perfectly? And, um, well, you can never filter, you never know for sure. Well, you know, what does that mean? I'm given, two sig I'm given a signal which represents noise plus signal. That's what, I'm, that's what, I'm, that's what I receive. And, I, and let's say that I know the average value of the noise and the average value of the signal. Otherwise, I could just add to one and subtract from the other. But the, uh, so I'm given this sum, when can I know, that, the, that when can I filter perfectly? So it's not hard to show that if this, if this sequence re is, comes about from one system, the other sequence comes about from another system, there's certain information about the two systems which will guarantee that, that I mean, if they interact in such a different way, in, other, in such a way, then, then I can filter one from the, from the sum. Because they act so differently, I can I'm able to filter, and uh, the way what I have to what I have to know about the dy dynamical systems they're somehow very different from one another. For example, if one was periodic or almost periodic, and the other is like a random noise, then you can you can filter. You can easy, it's not hard to to see how you can how you can filter. If you know the system, I know what what the period is, or even I don't even have to know what the system is there. Just take periodic plus random noise, white noise, you can easily filter because my explanation is because the systems that generate them are disjoint. They're disjoint in the sense of being, no matter how you try to represent them together, no matter how you try to put a sequence here together with a sequence there, make one system out of it, you'll really be producing the product system. And that becomes a definition of disjointness that if I have X and I have Y, and two 
systems on them, two transformations on them, and I look at the product of them. The only way I can get a, a measure theoretic, an invariant measure on the product, which moves down to the given system here and the given system here, and is invariant measure is, is the product measure. So they become independent. Everything happening here is independent of everything happening here. So that was the idea underlying disjointness. And that was one of the applications. But in studying it, you can you ask what is disjoint from what and make use of that. And that came out to be a, 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 a Diophantine theorem. This corresponds to co-prime. I mean, to two numbers being co-prime if you look at the natural numbers. Well, in terms of the structure, in other words, you, uh, two numbers are co-prime. You can look if they have a common denominator, but it, sometimes it turns out to be better to look if they have, what is their least common multiple? Okay. If the least common multiple yes. is their product, then... Uh, so this is just this kind of a useful analogy. I, I would like to hear your reaction to something Harishandra said. And I quote, I have often pondered over the roles of knowledge or experience on the one hand and imagination or intuition on the other in the process of discovery. I believe that there is a certain fundamental conflict between the two and knowledge by advocating caution tends to inhibit the flight of imagination. Therefore, a certain naivete, unburdened by conventional wisdom, can sometimes be a positive asset. Do you have any comment to that? No, I agree with that. The, uh, <laughs> but I think the imagination also works with, I mean, you imagine a, a horse with a, you imagine a, a, a unicorn. Because it's, on the one hand, it's similar to things that you already recognize. But you let your imagination go and you, uh, and you put together something that you imagine. And I think in mathematics, the idea you start with something similar and you say, well, let's, let's try this. Let's, try, let's make it a little bit different and see if this works also. And, uh, because it seems to me that uh, you are a very good example of some, uh, uh, the thing that uh, Harishandra is talking about, that from your early days at Yeshiva University, when you sort of, uh, you, you know, you let your imagination work and you try to prove something, something didn't work out, but some other things really worked out. Um, <laughs> I'm happy if you think of it that way, yes. You seem to have an eye for when a process is uh, regular and uh, when there is some sort of random-like procedure. Do you have any wisdom to share on, on that? How do you recognize whether a system is random-like or regular? Well, I can, for example, a mixing property is, it puts in randomness and, uh, and uh, Regularity is something something close to periodicity in some form or other, and uh, the, uh, uh, the one notion of 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 uh, there's a notion called that the original uh, the original writers on topological dynamics Gottschalk and Hedlund called almost periodic in a in a dynamical system is um, that whatever uh, that any any anything that takes place, if a point moves into any neighborhood of itself, then this happens, this will happen with bounded intervals. Not peri periodically, periodically it would be the same interval of time. But if it happens with bounded intervals of time, they call that almost periodic. And now it turns out that every, that every minimal system, means a system that no, has no subsystem in it, uh, on a compact space, or, always has this almost periodic almost periodicity property. So at, at any rate, I, I say that regularity is something that is close to periodicity. Bachner introduced the notion of almost automorphic functions. And one of the things that I gained from visiting Princeton um, while I was at Minnesota was to learn about almost automorphic functions and show how they what the dynamics, how the dynamics uh, um, of that explains the almost automorphic property. Um, um, the almost, uh, dynamically almost automorphic means that if I can get from, from point X arbitrarily close to Y, 
using using the act group that's acting or using the integers, whatever, then I can get back I can get from y back to x using the some uh, some set of integers. You can go, if you go from x to y, you can also go from y uh, to x. Actually, using no using the same sequence backwards. Um, and, um, we cannot uh, finish or end this interview without commenting on uh, the book that you published in 1981 titled Recurrence in Ergodic Theory and Combinatorial Number Theory. It's a wonderful book. It's an absolutely marvelous book which has enthralled many, including the two of us. And this it describes in exemplary clarity how one can apply dynamical systems and ergodic theory to combinatorics and number theory and thereby proving some highly non-trivial results. And of course this has spawned a lot of generalization by your students uh, Bergelson and, uh, and also co-works with uh, Katznelson uh, and um, you know the Hale-Stewart theorem, you, you know all the generalizations. It's uh, uh, you, you must be very, very happy the, the, about the um, ramifications of this book or, or, or of your thinking in general about dynamical system and number theory. Certainly, it's uh, like, uh, well, one is proud of one's children and maybe in some sense even more proud of the grandchildren. <laughs> it sort of shows that there's a, there's a line going there and, uh, um, and the same thing is true about uh, in mathematics what your students can do and what their students are, are doing and, uh, and colleagues and uh, in general ramifications is certainly, uh, um, I don't like to admit it, but that's the, uh, uh, one, li one likes to have that, uh, that, that, that feeling. I mean, that's, that's in some sense the, the, the real prize. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, people hear about it and, um, well, that's that's one form of of, uh, of becoming publicized. But what you really appreciate is when people who understand what you're doing uh, are, are are continuing that. But you know, it, 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 coming back to this book, I mean, when I read that, I, I was flabbergasted to put it. Uh, you know, how how can you prove a theorem that could be formulated in uh, you know uh, combinatorial number theory or approximation? Uh, Diophantine approximation, and then you construct a dynamical system that perfectly answers the question. And it's it's really amazing the first time you see this. But in some sense, uh, well, Margulis has done something has done something similar with the Oppenheimer conjecture, where where he took a number purely number theoretic problem, and well, he wasn't the one who he solved the ergodic theoretic side of it. It was. Uh, you know, the Raghunathan showed that this number theoretic problem would follow from a certain property of a, of a dynamical system, except the dynamics was not one, par one parameter, the dynamics was from a, from a certain Lie group. And that led to, to his, the great work on, uh, of, uh, of uh, well, one of the things of Margulis, the, um, which became, in its f most, f most polished form, became Ratner's theorem. No. Could, I, could I, before we finish, because I have one more question, can we ask you, do you have a favorite theorem, a favorite result that you proved? Are there one result that really stands out in your imagination? Well, I guess it's the Samaradi theorem as a, as a theorem, whereas the boundary theory is a theory and not, not a theorem. Um, I, guess, I, I would mention that. If I'm allowed to bring in something that hasn't come into any of the discussions of my work, and it's something that I would like to maybe maybe would come out of the fact that the public public publicizing my work is is more, the more recent work on fractals. The, the I have a monograph called Ergodic Theory and Fractal Geometry, in which ergodic theory is shown to play a role in in this the the study of fractals and dimension of fractals and the, the idea there being that given, well, any geometric object, you can look at it closer and closer and closer and, and magnify and the question is what kind of, what do you see? And you have things which are periodic, like if you take the Cantor set and you go down a certain amount, you'll see this Cantor set again. You go down a certain amount, you'll see the Cantor set again. But now if you take the, the ordinary Cantor set 
and multiply that by another Cantor set based on, instead of three, based on four, and you take that, and what happens there when you go down and you zoom down to, to a point, what do you see? You see pictures which, is, it's not going to be periodic, it'll be almost periodic. And so you can, you can think, you can see as, as soon as you have a possibility of, of periodicity or recurrence, then that's room for ergodic theory to come in, and it, it really does. And, um, and that's where there is other, other people have worked on, on some conjectures of mine that are related to, to dimension of fractals, how one cantor set how it, how it inter, can intersect another cantor set, that this should be similar to the way manifolds, algebraic manifolds, varieties intersect, and this should be some rule about, about this. And that was recently, my conjecture there was recently proved by uh, two, two mathematicians, uh, um, so one Wu and um, the other one, I forget the name right, for the moment. At any rate, the, uh, uh, that is a, there is current interest in that aspect of, uh, of uh, er connection between ergodic theory and, uh, and uh, fractal geometry. It must be tremendous to, to so, so as far as I remember, this was a paper in the annals that you were referring to by Meng Wu? Right, yes, yes. 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 Uh, it, it must be amazing to- The other person is Schmerkin, uh, Pablo Schmerkin independently uh, proved it, but, the, uh, but Wu's proof makes use of this ergodic theory of, of, of uh, something called a CP process, which uh, it comes about naturally when you, look at, when you try to look at things uh, um, as a kind of a process that you're zooming in at a fixed rate of time, so you know, at, at a fixed rate. Now, what what are, how do, what are you seeing on this on your screen? You know, how does this change? How does this picture change? Instead of numbers changing, you could have pictures changing, and that could be also a stationary process. And this uh, every every fractal generates some kind of a stationary process, which is uh, interesting to look at. We have bunches of other questions on our notepads, but I think we have to stop there. And on behalf of the Norwegian and the European Mathematical Society, we would like to thank you for this interesting interview and look forward very much to meeting you in person in Oslo at uh, the next Abel Prize event. I'm looking forward to that, <laughs> among other reasons, in order to be able to put things on the blackboard that people will really be able to understand these, uh, the things that we've been talking about abstractly. And, uh, we look forward to your coming to Oslo next year in May. We are too, very much. Thank you very much.